Welcome to Evil Live, the live media commentary show that answers the question, how we are, <laughs> I totally messed that up, how we are giving the devil his due. How are we? How we are giving him? I don't know. Subscribe if you're new to the channel, because uh, today we're reviewing Terran Wanderer. This is uh, the Chronicles of Prydain, book four by Lloyd Alexander. It was originally published by Holt Reinhardt and Winston on August 24th, 1967. I'm going back. This is a deep cut. So let's get into uh, what this story is about. I actually didn't really want to read this. In point, in fact, after I read the first two books in this series, I didn't want to read any of the other ones, but it was given to me as a gift, and so I read it. And I only have one book after this, which I'm kind of glad because I want to get to <laughs> more adult books. Um, I've got a queue of them just lined up, and I cannot wait to read them. Uh, and so you know, why am I even bothering with kids' books? And, you know, how am I going to, as an adult, fairly review a children's book? Well, I just suspend disbelief and pretend I'm a kid. <laughs> it's pretty much that simple. Um, this is a little bit different of a book than the previous ones. You know, the previous ones have a a much more narrative premise where it you know, sets up a story and then you sort of go forward with the story and you complete the story. This one is true to the name of Wanderer. It's really just a collection of experiences that Taryn has in Prydain. So basically he's down at Ker Dalbin with Dalbin and he's like, look, I need to find out who my parents are. You've never told me. Uh, you claim not to know or not, you know, just the fact that you just won't tell me. And I want to know who I am. And the whole reason why he's so interested in this is because he wants to ask Prince Islandwee to marry him. And, and these are still kids, we have to remember. But the fact that there's this blossoming romance, even though it's a juvenile one at this point, you know, and of course, if we're sort of reflecting back on fantasy medieval times, you didn't really live past 30. <laughs> you know, that was old age. And so your teens, 14, 15, 16, is when you were considered a man and you should own land and you should be cultivating that land. So it's not so far removed from belief that he would be thinking about marrying Island Wee at this point in his life. Uh, he has grown up. He has gone on many adventures. He's a dear friend of Prince Gwydion, uh, you know, king of man's son. And, you know, that sort of looks over the high king and looks over all of Pride Aim. So, uh, you know, he's in a position where he thinks, you know what, I have something to offer if I could just find out if my parents are royal or not. And if they are royal heritage, then I could justifyingly ask her for her hand in marriage and everything would be great. He feels a little bit off if he's not actually from noble birth. And of course, if we're just looking at the chances, the percentages, they're pretty doggone low that he's going to be <laughs> anyone of royalty. So he sets off with Dalbin's blessing, and of course Gurgi goes with him because Gurgi goes everywhere with him. I gotta be honest, I want a Gurgi in my life. <laughs> I really do. Gurgi's a great friend companion. He's just, you know, he was introduced to us as a sort of wild creature that Prince Gwydion knew of, and he's turned into a valuable friend and ally, and someone who genuinely looks after Terran and will do anything, including lay down his life for him. So it's this, this really wonderful relationship they have, this friendship that they've, they've uh, developed over the past, well, four books now. Okay, so he doesn't know where to go to find his parents, and he only knows two groups of enchanters. There's Dalbin, and Dalbin doesn't know or claims not to know. So the other only group are the uh, witches, Ordu, Orwen, or Orgok. Now, this is a terrifying proposition. He has to go into the marshes. He has to travel all this territory and hope he's not going to run into any danger. But ultimately, he has to convince them somehow. And you know these three witches. They're just like the witches from Macbeth. They want something in return. They want something desperate. It's got to be something good. You know, last time they tried to get memories from him, just steal memories out of his brain. And they're constantly trying to turn you into a different creature because they think you'll feel better about your life if you are these other strange creatures. So it's kind of scary. Gurgi's terrified. He doesn't want to go there at all. Oh, I do want to um, just, you know, before I get into this too far, Ocran, the villain from the very first book and the third book, she actually, now that she's stripped of her power, she's over at Ker Dalbin with them. And just sort of working 
um, as in the scullery, as a scullery maid with uh, Dalvin. And it's, it's really interesting seeing someone that was so high and mighty that almost ruled all of Prydain through evil and power to now be humbled so greatly and actually seemingly content. I think it's a really great story arc for Ocran. Uh, anyway, so uh, he goes to see these three witches and they're like, look, yeah, we know exactly who your parents are, but it's going to cost you. And he has nothing to give. So they're like, well, look, we're not going to. We're not going to give you something for nothing. You need to come up with something tangible that we want that is of value equal to the secret that you want to know. And he has nothing. And so, you know, he's sort of dispirited. And they say, look, you go up into the mountains. There's a mirror there, an enchanted mirror. You look in the mirror. It will tell you what you want to know. It'll tell you who your parents are. It'll tell you your destiny. It'll just generally tell you what you're seeking. And so the entire book is really centered around his journey from the, the marsh swamp up to the high mountains. And I'm not going to go through every single encounter, but there are some that I find interesting. But all of them, the point of each encounter is to teach Taryn another lesson or to highlight the growth that he has already gone through from the very first novel of just a, a child dreaming about adventure and not knowing anything about anything to a very competent young man at this point who is capable of defending himself and his friends, his ideologies, uh, his morals, and standing up to imminent danger. Uh, there comes a point where he travels. Um, oh, which one do I want to go through first? There's a bunch of really great ones. He is, his horse is stolen. And so he goes to King Smoit and is one of his lords that stole it. Uh, he, uh, convinced the Lord to give it back to him. And he went over to King Smoit and uh, um, Fluterflam was actually at King's, King Smoit's court. And so Fluterflam ends up coming and joining him. And uh, ultimately, King Smoit is going over to deal with the two lords that are now warring with each, or, each other, Lord Gast and Lord Gorion, uh, Gorion, who both claim to have some sort of uh, title or or have a claim to this magnificent horse or a cow that all the other, you know, I, I think it's supposed to be a bull, but they refer to it as a cow that all the other cows are sort of heirs of. And uh, it comes to blows and it comes to war. And it's something that happens cyclically according to King Smoit. And, and this is a lesser King. And so he's going out, you know, basically to bring them back to his prison. And he, almost drowns in a river through this freak accident, goes over a waterfall, and it's because of Taryn that he's pulled out and saved. And then ultimately, Taryn passes judgment on behalf of King Smoit by suggesting that, look, they're not learning anything from going to your prison. How about we make them give the cow to the landowner whom they trampled their land in their war, making it so he couldn't have a living for the coming year. And the offspring of that cow now goes to one of each of them. And then, of course, the all the mixed cows that all sort of went together um, between the two lords, one lord gets to choose whose cows go, um, you know, sort of separate the cows. The other lord gets to choose which grouping of cows. And it's the most fair possible way. And this really impresses the king. So ultimately, the king's like, look, I don't have any heirs. You have a great head on your shoulders. If you really want to be royalty, come to my kingdom. You can be my heir and I will give you my kingdom when I die. Like you are the most fair young man I've ever met. You have great connections with uh, the the high king. Like you would be a great lord. And Taryn's like, look, I'm, I love the offer. Thank you so much. I really do genuinely appreciate your, your faith in me. Um, but I need to know who my actual parents are. And if they're royalty, then I want to be their heir. So he continues on. He goes through a bunch of these. Um, one of the most memorable is actually a, a picture on the cover here of the book. It's a lich. He actually runs into a lich. So you guys remember Dolly, the fair folk, the dwarf, who can turn himself invisible and stuff. Well, he's turned into a frog. And it's actually um, Lion, uh, that gigantic cat from the last book that sort of favored um, Fluterflam. Um, Lion, it, I don't know, I have it under Dalbin. That's weird. Anyway, um, Fluterflam, uh, Lion goes and like brings back this frog that's like talking as if it's Dury, the dwarf. 
and they realize he was turned this way. They have to go through this sort of enchanted rose bush barrier, get into the lich's house, and the lich had uh, put all of his soul and essence in his phylactery, which is very a D and D thing to do, Dungeons and Dragons. But anyway, they happened across this phylactery, which is like this little pin hidden in a, a trunk of a dead tree randomly in the forest. And it's something that Fluorfam didn't want anything to do with, but it's a good thing that Terran brought it with him. And so ultimately, um, he turns Fluterflam into a rabbit, he turns Gurgi into a mouse, and uh, he actually is doing all this through this gem that he got from Angerad of Lear, daughter of Egret. Regret. That's Ilanwi's mother. So it's really, really interesting that there's this um, ancestry of enchanter, powerful enchanters of uh, Ilanwi's uh, lineage, then we learn in this that she wasn't actually sent to Ocarin to learn from her. She was stolen by Ocarin. And um, Ang Angerad actually had lost this um, a gem that was gifted to her mother by the Fair Folk. And as soon as this lich, um, his name is uh, Morda, as soon as Morda got this little enchanted gem, he put it on his necklace and... Um, has been using it and sort of discovering its power to extend his life and stuff like that to become the Lich. So anyway, ultimately, because Terran has that pin, which is the phylactery, the soul of the Lich, when the Lich tries to kill him, it doesn't work. And so the Lich realizes that he's got this and he's like begging him, please, please, please don't do it. Ultimately tries to sneak attack on Terran and get it back. And they end up defeating uh, Morda and every enchantment that Mord has ever made turns back to normal. Now Terran has this gem. He ends up giving it to uh, Dolly. Uh, is it Dory? No, it's Dolly. He gives it to Dolly the dwarf, the fair folk dwarf, to give back to his king. And um, this generates a lot of goodwill on behalf of the fair folk to Terran. Because ultimately, Terran's a good kid, you know? He's fair. He's not trying to steal things from other people. He realizes it's not his. And quite frankly, it's not really Island Wee's either, because it was his mom, her mom's. And so he gives it back to the source. Dolly looks at this great horn that Island Wee had gifted him uh, in the last book. And he tells him that, look, you blow this once and the fair folk will come and help you with any situation. But it only works once. So make sure you save it for a really um, special occasion. The next encounter I want to talk about um, is when he runs across this campfire of a bunch of brigands. And they trick him into because um, they believe he's going after some sort of treasure or gold, not actually looking for his parents. And so they trick him into fighting for the right to be free, which is an absurd thing, but it's either that or they kill them all. And so uh, he agrees, Taryn agrees to fight this, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Dorath, this brigand, actually beats the guy, but Dorath cheats. And so he sort of wins in the end. And if it was just a fair fight, Terran would have beat this this adult seasoned war veteran that, you know, a sellsword that is now turned to a life of bri brigandry since there's not much sellsword uh, work going on. Um, and he's a sort of running villain um, for a, an encounter later on in two different encounters later on. But um, the fact is, is that, you know, he, his sword is taken from him. And then um, Terran sort of goes on this Thus Spake Zarathustra almost journey where he's going and meeting all these different types of people and learning something valuable about himself and about life um, through these encounters and experiences where he, you know, he, he apprentices under a blacksmith, under a weaver, under a, um, a potter. And all this, and then, you know, he meets this random family who just lives on luck and ends up helping them and finding it. And, and ultimately, it's him learning what it means to be not just a good person, but himself, who he is as an individual. And finally, he goes up to this mirror, which is actually just a little pond in a lake of a little water pool that you're supposed to look in. And if it's enchanted at all, no one really knows, but he looks into it. And he just sees himself and he sees the experiences that he's gone through. And he realizes that it's not important who his parents are, that what's important is the life that he's leading. And this was such a beautiful moment. And it sounds sort of cheesy and cheap and, you know, trite, if I'm being honest. Um, but in the moment reading it, it really did impact me. And it affected my ultimate rating once I give you that uh, at the end of this. 
so much of who and what we are is shaped by not just the society we were raised out of, the culture that we were raised in, the parents and friends, but overt um, or subversive decisions that we've made about ourselves. Um, we go through life thinking we want to be X or Y, and sometimes that lands with who and what we truly are. Uh, and sometimes it's just something that we're chasing because we think we want it. And the truth is maybe we want something else. And finding out who you are as uh, an adult or a young man, a young man or woman in this particular case, that's the journey of youth. And, you know, it's such an important journey that we all go through. And sometimes we come out on the other side of it and, and we're better for it. And sometimes we're worse for it. And sometimes it broke us the journey. Um, Sometimes we don't make or get out of it alive, and that's the, a, a tragic truth, but it is in fact a truth. Learning who you are as an individual outside of your social, political, cultural environment that you are raised in is wildly important because then suddenly you're, you're no longer being influenced by those around you, and you're forced to decide for yourself through your own thoughts and actions who am I going to be? Am I going to be okay with myself? And everyone lands on this answer differently. You know, everyone's morals may be influenced by those other um, factors that I mentioned, but ultimately it's a choice we make. And whether we're aware of the choice or not, it's a choice that we decide on. This is the type of person I want to be. These are the morals that I find important. And these are the things that I find unimportant. And then how you act throughout your life and the individuals that you meet. You know, I've, I've often said that we make everything up in life. There's no such thing as jobs. We made that up in order to make money, which we made up. Uh, in order to have bigger, better houses and cars, which we made up. Nothing is actually real except for the tangible survival instincts and our relationships with each other. And that's not to say that you have to love everyone. I don't. I hate a lot of people. I don't go out of my way to hate people. But if you, you know, wrong me, then I'm going to hate you for that. Um, and it's okay to hate people. It's just a, an aspect of reality. It's an aspect of relationships and it's, it's an aspect of life. Just as despair and sorrow and anger and regret and fear and love and uh, um, uh, enlightenment. You know, these are all aspects of a healthy human being that they experience from time to time. You can't always dwell in happiness. You can't always dwell in, in sorrow. If you want to be a healthy human being, you have to be malleable enough to experience all of these different emotions and aspects of life and learn from them, hopefully. And sometimes I want to feel bad. Sometimes I want to feel sorrow. And that feels good, you know, in the end. Uh, but I don't want to dwell there always. I, you know, I want to move on and be productive in some manner in life. But it's the relationships that we have that I find so incredibly important. And that's mirrored in Taryn's experience in this. And I really appreciate that aspect of it. Ultimately, he learns there's nothing special about him. He doesn't find out who his parents are, and he realizes that it's not important. And so he goes back to Care Dalvin. And so the entire book is him leaving, learning, and coming home, the hero's journey. Um, and that's ultimately what this entire series is about. But in a microcosm, that's what this book is about. And I, I really loved it. You know, I'm, the more I read about this land of Prydain, this, tr this uh, collection of books, the more I really like it and wish that there was an adult version of tales written in this land because it's ripe for political controversy, uh, political machinations. It's ripe for war and for love and for adventure. It's just a really great fictional world. And um, anyway, I thought it was a lot of fun uh, reading it. So my review for this episode is going, I mean, it's my review, my rating is going to be four out of five evil eyes. I really liked this book in the end. You know, the first half of it was okay. It's just sort of, it's not as narratively interesting as the rest per se. But the the last half of this book, I really resonated with in a big, big way. And I really, really loved it. I mean, I'm, I'm a big Nietzsche fan anyway. And so anything that mirrors a little bit of Z Thus Spake Zarathustra, uh, I'm going to like. And this really did have these tiny little, you know, notes that reflected that uh, wonderful book.
book. So I highly recommend it if you like fantasy, if you like Lloyd Alexander, or if you're just starting the Chronicles of Prydain, stick with it. It's interesting. It, it might resonate with you as well, and I hope it does because, because it is a good fantasy story. All right. All that being said, thank you all so much for tuning in. I really appreciate your time and attention. I hope you have a fantastic day. And as always, remember, evil spelled backwards is live. So get your asses out there and be evil. Thank <music> you.